Welcome to the virtual rebroadcast of PubK's 2024 Government Contracts Annual Review. During this week, we are presenting 14 panel discussions featuring more than 70 expert practitioners, as well as two in-depth conversations with key government officials. PubK publishes news and insights for the government contracts community, such as PubK protests and claims, PubK cybersecurity and data privacy, and PubK compliance and enforcement. In addition to our annual review, we also host webinars, podcasts, and in-person networking meetings during the year. If you'd like to learn more about PubK, visit us online at pubkgroup.com. All of this week's presentations were recorded live at our in-person conference in February at the Ronald Reagan International Trade Center. You can join any or all of these sessions during the week using the same link and password you use today. All attendees will be in listen-only mode. Your video will remain disabled through the entire session. Many of our panelists are joining us today to answer questions about their presentations. Enter your question into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and the panel will address as many as possible during the webinar. If time allows, we'll open up a live Q&A session after the video presentation. Our briefing book, which includes all of this week's slide presentations and other materials, are available for download from the PubK website. We are applying for continuing legal education CLE approval in Virginia, California, Texas, Florida, Colorado, and Kansas. While we cannot guarantee approval, we expect acceptance within the next few weeks. We will notify all attendees when those approvals have been received. If you received CLEs for our in-person event, you can apply for additional CLEs for panels that you may have missed. And finally, if you are interested in obtaining CLE, please look for our poll question during the presentation. The state boards require us to verify your participation during the event. The poll is a simple yes-no question. We will keep track of all responses to verify that you viewed the panel. If you do not wish to obtain CLE credit, you can disregard the poll. This conference would not have been possible without the strong support of our event sponsors, all of whom are listed on the next few slides. Our sponsors also provided speakers for our event and other valuable input. We encourage you to review the strengths and capabilities of these firms and to reach out to them directly with any questions you may have. And now we present our next panel, Claims, Disputes, and Terminations. A big thank you to PubK Law. This is uh, the first time in at least three or four years this community has gotten together. It's awe-inspiring to, to see this many people in a room, so we're very excited to talk to you about uh, claims, disputes, and terminations today. Uh, so you know who's talking here. Let's see. Well, let me start with me. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm Paul Corey, co-chair of the uh, Government Contracts Practice at Wiley, uh, and we've got a great panel for you today, including Michelle Coleman from Kroll, David Bodenheimer from Nichols Lou, Seth Locke for Perkins Coie, and Chris Griesedek from Venable. Um, we're very excited, uh, and we got a lot of material to cover in a lot less time than we normally do. So I, we like to start out usually by giving you some themes that we're going to be talking about throughout the day. Um, one of the things that we have this year that we don't have in, in many years is that we have two Supreme Court cases this year in the government contract space, both, both in the False Claims Act arena. One, unanimous, which is kind of uh, unique. Uh, and the other, most interesting because of what's in the dissent and, uh, and some of the concurrences and what that might mean for the future of the FCA. Uh, we have three federal circuit cases, which again, is a pretty, pretty hefty number for, for the government contracts arena. Uh, and, and they're all in different subject matter areas. We have a number of cases that are based on Supreme Court law. For example, 
Uh, the first case we'll be talking about, ECC, is based on a Supreme Court case this year, Wilkins v. U.S., that, that basically says that a rule isn't jurisdictional unless Congress made it jurisdictional. There's been a slew of cases in that arena, and that's one of them. There's another case we'll be talking about that, interestingly, um, uh, harkens back to the um, Obamacare uh, Supreme Court case, um, uh, Federation of Independent Business versus Sebelius, where um, the question was, is something a tax or a penalty? So kind of interesting that we have that in our context. Uh, as is usual for some of you who've attended these before, we have what, uh, what we call cases where the government is behaving badly. Um, and, you know, we might be biased in that. So we have a few of those. Uh, but uh, to be fair, we also have at least one that Michelle will be talking about where a contractor is behaving badly, too. So we, we'll, we'll cover the gamut on that. Always in the, uh, in the uh, statute of limitations context, um, I I'm, I'm start scratching my head saying, why are you waiting so long? And we have some cases where, with why are you waiting so long. But this year we also have, interestingly, uh, uh, a case where the contractor did have a plan B. So good for you for having a plan B. That's the Lockheed case we'll be discussing. Um, almost every year we have a significant KBR case, and this year is no different. Um, <laughs> uh, and it's an important case on when a board can consider allegations of fraud. Um, although it's not a dispute, um, for several years we've, we've had a FOIA case in there. Uh, to talk to you about um, what, what the latest is on FOIA because a lot of us deal with uh, our competitors trying to figure out uh, stuff about our contracts. And then this year we have a real treat. It's different from uh, anything we've done before. As you may have noticed, we haven't had any defective pricing final decisions in a long time, so we, we haven't talked about them here. But, uh, but these uh, defective pricing cases are being litigated uh, consistently, and David Bodenheimer is going to be talking to us about things that are capable of repetition yet avoiding final decision in the defective pricing space. So we're, we're very excited. We've got a lot to cover in not, not very much time, so we're going to get right into it. With uh, uh, Michelle is going to start us off with the ECC case, probably one of the most talked about cases of the year, and from my perspective, a government behaving badly case too. So Michelle? All right, thank you, Paul. Um, you're right, this is a big case. It's been widely discussed and written about in the last year. So unless you're you know, living under a rock or you just don't pay attention to the cases that well, um, I am gonna hit the highlights and then we'll talk a little bit about the impact. So starting here, and I'm gonna call it ECCI. Uh, ECCI had a construction delay claim in February of 2014. That delay claim was broken into three discrete categories. The ECCI appealed a deemed denial of that, uh, the delay claim in um, October 2014. Uh, during the appeal period, the parties negotiated extensively, including leading up to an ADR, or alternative dispute resolution, uh, in 2019. The parties had a hearing in 2020, and after the hearing, which was six years after ECCI filed its claim, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers filed a motion to dismiss for lack of jurisdiction, stating that ECCI had failed to state a sum certain for each distinct claim. Now, the Armed Services Board of Contract Appeals granted that motion because the sum certain requirement had been held to be jurisdictional. On appeal at the Federal Circuit, the court reversed that holding and said, consistent with recent Supreme Court precedent, the some certain requirement is not jurisdictional. Now, the Supreme Court has held recently that, um, as Paul had mentioned, uh, a requirement isn't jurisdictional unless Congress expressly states that it is. And here, the Federal Circuit noted that the some certain requirement, it's not even mentioned in the Contract Disputes Act. If you look in, in uh, 41 U.S.C. 7107, you're not going to find it. What you will find is in the FAR, that's where it tells you that there needs to be a some certain for a, a, for a claim. Um, the FAR is not, or the Federal Acquisition Regulation is not promulgated by Congress, and so uh, it cannot be jurisdictional. And I find this interesting because when we look back at Sikorsky, which um, came out in 2014, the Federal Circuit there held that the 
uh, that the statute of limitations requirement, which is in the Contract Disputes Act, is also not jurisdictional. But there, you actually find the six-year statute of limitation requirement in 41 U.S.C. 7103-4A. Um, but that, that statement doesn't actually say that the statute is clearly jurisdictional. So I think that leaves the question of what does this mean for all the other items that were believed to be jurisdictional. You know, the Contract Disputes Act says very few things with respect to uh, the requirements of a claim. It says contractors must submit a claim to a contracting officer for a final decision, that that uh, claim must be in writing, uh, the, C the contracting officer or the CO must issue a written decision, and then the contractor, of course, has six years, or the government has six years for their claims um, to submit them after they've accrued, and then there's a certification requirement. You have to certify any claim that's over $100,000 by an individual who, is, um, binding, who can bind the contractor. So there are very few requirements uh, in the Contract Disputes Act, and none of them really state um, whether their failure to meet these requirements would um, divest the boards of contract appeals from having jurisdiction over these claims. And the statute itself doesn't even define a claim. That's also defined in the FAR. Um, it doesn't say what a claim needs to say. It doesn't say what a contracting officer's written decision needs to say. Uh, that's what we find in the federal acquisition regulation or in case law. Um, but of course, the Federal Circuit said here, the some certain requirement, which is in the FAR, is not jurisdictional. It's simply a claims processing rule that has to be followed, uh, but wouldn't divest the boards from jurisdiction. So lacking a some certain can be dismissed then for failure to state a claim upon which relief can be granted. So in essence, a contractor or the government could waive such an argument if they wanted to argue that the contractor or the government doesn't have a some certain. So I think this leaves a lot of open questions, Paul. I mean, what, if anything, in the Contract Disputes Act is jurisdictional? For example, uh, does the board um, need to have a contracting officer's final decision in order to have jurisdiction? Can a party re-raise a claim that was dismissed for failure to state a claim? Or are they going to be barred by res judicata? You know, will judges raise this issue, these, these types of issues, sua sponte, um, if it's a, a requirement that's believed to be jurisdictional but may not be under this new case law? Uh, the Supreme Court has held that a judge um, or courts must enforce jurisdictional rules sua sponte, even in the face of potential forfeiture or waiver by, the par by a party. Um, but that rule doesn't apply if the, the item isn't or the requirement isn't actually jurisdictional. Um, so I don't know if getting determining whether there are claims or there's jurisdictions is going to get easier. It seems like each year it gets a little bit harder. Um, but before I close out, I will just mention there have been a few cases um, following ECCI that's looked at the some certain requirement. Uh, this actual case was remanded, Federal Circuit remanded it to the Armed Services Board of Contract Appeals to determine whether um, the Arm U.S. Army Corps of Engineers actually forfeited their uh, their argument that the that ECCI didn't submit some certains for each of their individual discrete claims, and the board said that they had. But of course, there had been six years, um, so you may be safe to assume as a contractor or the government that six years is um, definitely forfeiture um, or waiver. The ASBCA issued the JE Dunn Construction Company case in December 2013 following ECCI, and in that case, they said uh, the government actually forfeited their right as well. Now, that case was filed in January of 2020 and the hearing was held at the end of February, beginning of March 2023, which might literally be the fastest case I've ever seen get to trial. Um, but um, the, the, the board said that the government um, had uh, had wait or forfeited its right to raise the some certain requirement. And then there was also the ASBCA's um, or Armed Services Board of Contract Appeals McCarthy Dunn decision where the board declined to decide whether there was an issue, a uh, failure to state a claim where some certain wasn't required because they just didn't have enough facts. So, Paul, I think this is going to be a really interesting area, a case law to, to watch develop over the next yeah. few years. Agreed. And there are also uh, two uh, other Federal Circuit cases in different contexts uh, bid protests, a khaki case where interested party was found not to be jurisdictional, and also uh, M.R. Pittman where blue and gold uh, was found not to be jurisdictional. Now, both uh, of the, the protesters there lost, but um, the, the, the benefit here is you get past the motion to dismiss, and uh, as Michelle had said, uh, especially in a, a disputes context, the government can be deemed to have waived something. So you can't go through six years and then a trial and then all of a sudden bring up something that says, hey, we, we get out of, out of jail. Um, 
Another circuit court case um, is the Lockheed case that Seth's going to talk to us about. Thanks, Paul. Um, I mean, how exciting is this? Uh, we get to start with two federal circuit decisions dealing with jurisdiction, right? I mean, that's what all of us government <laughs> contract nerds get excited about, I would think. Um, I also just want to say uh, thank you to Pub K for, for hosting us, and I think it's great seeing so many people here. Um, so the Lockheed case comes down to this uh, issue of what constitutes a claim for purposes of jurisdiction. And specifically, it's dealing with um, undefinitized contract actions, UCAS. And so real quick, um, there's this process uh, that's provided uh, in, in the FAR where if the government needs critical, something critical and it's going to take time to negotiate specific terms of a contract or pricing, um, they can move forward with this process of uh, going through with the UCA, getting the work started, and then setting a schedule for negotiating specific terms of a contract, including the pricing. And that's what happened here where Lockheed uh, and the government entered into UCAS for upgrading F-16 aircraft. And after a period of time, they were unable to reach agreement on the price. So per the regulations, the contracting officer was allowed to issue and did a unilateral price determination. Now Lockheed challenged that and said the price that the uh, contracting officer issued was not reasonable in accordance with FAR Part 15 and FAR Part 31. And Lockheed went ahead and appealed directly that decision to the Armed Services Board of Contract Appeals as a government claim against Lockheed. And so the issue at the board became, was that in fact a government claim? And one of the things that the board looked at was the board actually had precedent on this issue. And it goes back to a case in um, 1988 Bell uh, Helicopter, where the board issued a decision, and in that case it was even more, uh, the facts were even a little bit more clear that the government actually issued a uh, unilateral determination on a UCA and said, this is our final decision, go ahead and appeal. And even in that case, the board in 1988 said, a UCA is not a government claim. So the board said, we're bound by precedent, we're gonna follow this, and uh, dismiss the action as not a proper uh, government claim that could be appealed directly to the board. Lockheed goes to the Federal Circuit, and the Federal Circuit, I think, you know, as Michelle was saying, it went right to the regs, because that's where you need to look at what the definition of a claim is. So it goes to the FAR, and it analyzed the specific language within the FAR. A matter of right, payment of money in a sum certain, the adjustment or interpretation of contract terms or other relief. So what does it mean to seek as a matter of right? And what the Federal Circuit said is, it has to, there has to be a demand for something due. And this UCA process, what's happening is the government is just following the normal FAR process of issuing a unilateral determination, but it's not actually seeking something that it believes is due. And so the Federal Circuit said, that is not a government claim. And so instead, the only party that's actually seeking something due here is the contracting officer. And so they would have to submit their own affirmative claim in order to get a final decision and invoke jurisdiction to then appeal to the Board of Contract Appeals. Now, I think Paul alluded to this. It's an interesting thing uh, aspect here. It came out in the briefing at the Federal Circuit, Lockheed did exactly that. They ended up belts and suspenders, making sure they were safe, within proper timing, they submitted their own claim, which was denied, and they appealed to the board. So I think, you know, a, a key takeaway here is, um, it can be really complicated to determine who's bringing what claim in certain circumstances. And I'll even, the Federal Circuit quoted Nash and Sabinic um, and said, Quote, in some cases, it is difficult to distinguish between government and contractor claims, end quote. I think we've all dealt with that. We've all seen that. And so if there's any uncertainty, make sure that you go ahead and submit your affirmative claim and pay attention to the statute of limitations when doing it. Don't wait too long. Yep. 
Yeah, Lockheed must have had a good lawyer representing him, right, Michelle? <laughs> um, okay, well, another jurisdictional case we're going to hear from Chris about. PAE. Good morning. Um, the PAE Applied Technologies case is actually similar to the one that Seth just talked about in terms of when do you have a government claim and final decision that you can appeal under the CDA. And uh, the big takeaway here is similar, which is that uh, if you have some basis to think it's a final decision, you should appeal. Um, and not assume that it's something else which you do not need to appeal yet. Um, so the facts here were that there was a cost reimbursable contract and the Navy determined that under that contract it had overpaid for COVID costs. This was a CARES Act case. And then it issued a demand for repayment of about $4.3 million plus applicable indirect rates and 2% 2, 2 fee on top of that. Now, the letter that PAE received from the Navy looked exactly like what you would expect if you were reading FAR 32604. That's the part of the FAR that has the requirements for a debt demand. It's a separate part of the FAR from 33211, which has to do with what needs to be in a final decision. So the letter said, uh, you know, this is a debt demand, interest is going to accrue, PAE can contact the CO if it disagrees, the Navy can recoup via offset, PAE can request installment payments all straight out of FAR 32.6. It did not say that this is a final decision. It did not say that you have appeal rights under the CDA, both of which the FAR requires a final decision to say. Nonetheless, PAE, uh, taking a sort of belt and suspenders approach, treated this debt demand as a final decision and government claim and appealed to the ASBCA. The Navy then withdrew the debt demand and argued that there was no jurisdiction. So what happened? The outcome was that the ASBCA denied the Navy's motion and held that that debt demand letter, even though it would look just like a debt demand under the FAR, was actually a government claim and a contracting officer's final decision such that you could appeal under the CDA and the board had jurisdiction. Um, this might be kind of a surprising outcome if you're just looking at the regulations, which is what the Federal Circuit actually did in the case that uh, Seth discussed. But here the ASBCA tended to look a little bit more at its own case law. Um, and it said that we determine whether or not there is a final decision on a case-by-case -case basis, and we look at the party's prior correspondence. And the test is whether or not there's a clear and unequivocal uh, statement in writing giving adequate notice of the basis and amount owed under the claim. And one key fact that the board highlighted was that here, the parties had been talking about this COVID money for some time. And the contracting officer admitted that uh, she had issued the debt demand letter to, quote, break the stalemate. And I think the board found that persuasive evidence saying that, look, this was not the beginning of some conversation. This was meant to be the end. It was clear what the government wanted, and it thought it was owed this money, this $4.3 million, as a matter of right. It didn't matter that uh, the CO subjectively didn't think that she was issuing a COFD based on prior case law. It didn't matter that the, that the debt demand letter didn't include your appeal rights. There have been cases saying that uh, not including those appeal rights in the COFD means that it's not a COFD, but that's only if it prejudices the contractor. Here, PAE had not been prejudiced. It appealed. It knew exactly what to do. Um, and so the board had jurisdiction. Uh, there were a few other points in there about whether or not there was a some certain issue as well. Um, and actually, there's a footnote that mentioned the ECCI case that Michelle talked about earlier. And the board sort of deftly maneuvered around that and said, uh, we think there's a some certain here, so we don't have to talk about that case. Um, and then ultimately, the Navy rescinded its demand. It said that we're not going to pursue this issue any further. And then the case was dismissed. So again, this really just highlights that if you have uh, something from the government, even if it looks like a very standard debt demand letter, you should think, what is actually going on here? Can I construe this or could somebody else construe this to be a final decision? One potential good practice is to immediately respond to that debt demand and say, we think this is a, de a debt demand, not a final decision. If you disagree, government, let us know. Um, or alternatively, if you want to proceed very quickly, go ahead and appeal and say, we think we have some basis to construe this as a final decision. All right, good advice. Um, well, uh, Michelle, we're back to you. We're actually going to be switching to the topic of statute of limitations, but um, we're uh, continuing to uh, talk about some certain. This, this is a case where it comes back to bite the government. Yes, that's true. I, I must love these some certain cases. But um, this really looks at what happens when the government's claim doesn't contain a some certain. So this is the crystal clear maintenance, or I'll call them CCM case. 
Uh, this actually, this case came out before ECCI came out, the case I talked about a little earlier. But in this case, uh, CCM had a, a contract with the General Services Administration uh, to do courthouse repair. At some point during the contract, there was water damage. The contracting officer blamed it on CCM and issued a letter or a demand that sought a minimum of $173,978.19 and stated that damages were still being assessed. Uh, in October 2022, that same contracting officer issued another letter, uh, this time demanding $741,797.50. And that was a very specific number and without that qualifier. So Crystal Clear Maintenance appealed that October 2022 to letter uh, with the specific amount and without the qualifier. And during that appeal, the General Services Administration filed a motion to dismiss for lack of jurisdiction, stating that CCM should um, have timely appealed the July 2021 letter, which had that qualifier. They were still assessing, and this is a minimum of what we expect. The Civilian Board of Contract Appeals denied that motion and stated that the July 2021 letter did not have a readily ascertainable amount or some certain, and therefore could not have started the appeal clock for CCM. So I think the key takeaways here is, while the some certain requirement is not jurisdictional, it's certainly a claims processing rule requirement, so you must have it uh, for the government. If you fail to include a some certain in a final decision, that's not gonna start the appeal clock for uh, contractors. So Paul, I think this rounds out our some certain cases for, yeah, for yeah. today. Yeah, fortunately we're moving on. But we're not moving on from uh, statute of limitations. This uh, next case we're going to be talking about, uh, Seth's going to be talking about, falls squarely into the why, why are you waiting so long uh, yeah. category. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. And I, I mentioned this earlier. Um, you know, you have this process where sometimes you want to have negotiations and be clear about the fact that you want it to be negotiations. But at some point, you need to be careful and make sure that you're paying attention to the clock. And if you're running up close to that clock, make sure you get a claim and a proper claim under the rules submitted to the contracting officer. And so that's really the gist of what happened here with Mid-Atlantic. Um, they had a construction contract um, and uh, it ended in 2015. Two years later in 2017, they um, submitted an REA. And in the REA, they were very clear. We want this to be a negotiation. We reserve our right to submit a claim later. And so, for the next four years, there was back and forth negotiation on this REA. And it was pretty clear the government was saying, you didn't provide nearly enough information, we need you to uh, submit more documentation, more support. And that's exactly what Mid-Atlantic was trying to do. But four years go by, and finally in 2021, Mid-Atlantic asks for the opportunity to submit a revised REA. And the government says, sure, go ahead. And they kept extending the deadline for this revised REA. So finally, they submit a revised REA, and this time they included, which they didn't do the first time, an REA certification, not a, CD, not a claim certification, which requires four distinct uh, items that you have to certify to. This was just the REA certification with only two. And the government rejected it. And at that point, Mid-Atlantic actually said to the government, well, wait a second, if you're gonna reject my REA, make it into a final decision so that I can actually appeal it. And the contracting officer, I think it's fair, said, why? You didn't submit a claim. You said this is still just an REA, so no, I'm not going to submit a final decision or issue anything like that. So now, Mid-Atlantic submits another submission. This time, it includes all four requirements for a certification and uses magic words that say, we'd like a final decision. Meanwhile, at this point, it seems like reading the case, the contracting officer was just getting frustrated. And so the contracting officer just said, I'm not dealing with this. So at that point, Mid-Atlantic was uh, appealed to the Court of Federal Claims. And what the Court of Federal Claims did was it looked through the record and really tried to parse out at what point was a claim actually submitted and did a claim ever even get submitted? And what the, what the court did was it looked at the first submission and it said, no, there's no certification. Now you can cure a defective certification, but you can't cure a wholesale lack of certification. So no, they threw that out and said that doesn't count. Then they looked at the revised REA that was submitted and the court said, well, it's got 
part of the certification. It's got part of what you would want for a claim, but then it was updated later, and we'll go ahead and cobble the whole thing together and look at everything in the aggregate, and eventually they did submit a, quote, claim. So the court accepted it for jurisdiction for that purpose. Then the court noted, okay, now the government is saying it's still outside the statute of limitations. We'll take a look at that. And the court noted that no one, neither party, briefed the Sikorsky decision that Michelle was talking about earlier. And so what the, what the court said is the statute of limitations, as we all know, not jurisdictional. So at this motion to dismiss stage, we're going to look at the facts in the light most favorable to Mid-Atlantic. And there was this questionable period about extending the submission of an REA and could the government be... Could the government have waived uh, or told the statute of limitations during that period? And so the court said, we're not going to dismiss at this point. We're going to let the record develop further uh, in, in terms of statute of limitations. But my, my key takeaway here and recommendation is we had to go through all these complicated facts to finally put together a claim after four years of negotiation and then another year of back and forth, different REAs, revisions. I would just caution, again, like I said at the beginning, don't try to cobble it all together. Submit a claim that's going to have all the requirements met. Yep, get the clock started and, yeah. and then follow, follow when it started. Um, okay, we're going to switch to um, contract claims, and uh, Chris is going to talk to us about the case I was uh, referring to earlier that actually mentions the uh, Supreme Court's ACA case. So. Yep, Triple Canopy is one of our uh, SCOTUS tie-ins today. Uh, this is an interesting one. Uh, basically, you had Triple Canopy that was providing private security services in Afghanistan, and there was a rule that said that you have to only have 500 employees if you're providing those services, unless, and this is critical, you get the Council of Ministers there to agree otherwise. And then later on, uh, the, a fee got tacked onto that. So if you exceed that 500 employee cap, the government of uh, Afghanistan can impose a fee on you. This is important because Triple Canopy, Canopy's various contracts included FAR 52.2296. And that clause basically says that if, um, that the government will provide a price adjustment for any after-imposed tax that the contractor is required to pay or bear. And so you can see where this is going. Um, eventually, uh, Triple Canopy does exceed the 500 employee cap. It seeks an exemption from the Council of Ministers. The government supports that. It never happens. And eventually, the government of Afghanistan says, you've got to pay this fee. Uh, they pay the fee, and then they seek an equitable adjustment under that clause from the government. And the government opposes that request, saying, no, that fee was not a tax under that clause. It was a penalty. And therefore, we're not going to pay it. So this winds up before the ASBCA and the board rules for the contractor and says, yes, it's true that this fee has some elements that might look like a penalty and that it is trying to get you to have fewer employees. But just because a tax is trying to get you to do something does not mean that it is a penalty. And it cites the Supreme Court's 2012 case in Sebelius on the Affordable Care Act um, for that proposition. And it says, basically, the key thing that you look to is whether or not the behavior that's being encouraged or discouraged is lawful. A tax can attempt to encourage you to do something that is lawful, but if a tax becomes so onerous and the thing that it's encouraging you to do is unlawful, at that point it's a penalty. And the board said that's not what we have here. The law specifically said that you can exceed that 500 employee cap as long as you get permission. So this was not unlawful behavior, it was just discouraged behavior. Therefore, we have a tax, not a penalty, and the government needs to provide a, uh, an equitable adjustment. Um, ultimately, the case um, had a consent judgment in favor of the contractor after this decision from the ASBCA in April of last year. All right, thanks. So uh, next case, we're going to be discussing Beechcraft. Uh, Seth, I mean, this is, a, it's, again, a complicated situation where uh, it's not clear when the government's claim accrued. That's right, and, and it, is, uh, it is a complicated fact pattern if you start with this first part, because um, we're getting into uh, the exciting world of cost accounting standards. Um, yeah. 
I'm surprised there's only one person clapping. Well, da <laughs> David would have been clapping if he was out there. So. Um, but uh, don't worry for the rest of you who did not clap. Um, I am not going to dive into the weeds of Thank cost you. accounting standards. You move along. <laughs> because really, the point of this case is, um, while it does deal with cast non-compliances, it's, it's a statute of limitations issue. Um, and so, uh, a little bit of background, um, DCAA issued an audit report, or multiple audit reports in 2011, um, saying that Beechcraft uh, had several cast non-compliances. And it took a, a, a little bit of back and forth uh, discussing these cast non-compliances before the government actually requested uh, general dollar magnitudes under the cast administration clause. And these, these general dollar magnitude, GDM, um, it's going to actually provide backup support and detail um, about the costs at issue, analyzing the costs under the non-compliance and the costs under a compliant uh, process under the cost accounting standards. And that's gonna allow the contractor and the government to then you know, calculate some type of cost impact uh, with these GDMs. And so there was a request for the GDM and Beechcraft submitted the GDMs in 2015. There was more back and forth. And then in 2017, the parties entered into tolling agreements. And there's two really key facts that are worth mentioning about these tolling agreements in 2017. Um, they told the accrual period for the government's claim from June 2017 to December 2017. June 2017 is six years after the DCAA audit report from June 2011. The other, the second important piece about these tolling agreements is there was a provision that said that neither party uh, uh, is admitting any liability or acknowledging any liability or admitting or acknowledging anything with regard to the statute of limitations. So the accrual period or the tolling agreement ends in December 2017. Five months later, in May 2018, the government issues its final decision for the, cat, the impact of the CAS non-compliances. So, Beechcraft at the uh, Board of Contract Appeals submits a motion for summary judgment saying that the government's claims are time barred by the six year statute of limitations. The government argued that this period from 2011 to 2015 before the GDM was submitted was a per se rule about suspending the period of accrual for the government's claim because the government said we didn't have the information we needed to know whether a claim actually accrued. And the board rejected that argument. The board said that um, there is nothing in the CAS administration clause where it requires a submission of a GDM that talks about this suspension of the accrual period for purposes of a claim. Also, the board was unaware of anything saying that submission of a GDM is a pre-claim requirement. And so the board ultimately said that this was not going to be a per se suspension. Now, what the board also said though is that you gotta look at the actual facts in each situation to determine whether the claim actually accrued. And here, the facts were unclear, the record had not been developed enough, there were audit documents that were not in the record, and there were some information that the gov there was some information in the record that the government did have access to Beechcraft's files and cost uh, backup that maybe it could have known or should have known about its own claim. And so the board ended up denying the, uh, the motion for summary judgment, saying we need to develop this further. But the key takeaway is, again, in these types of cases, so I am gonna be specific for a second about these types of cases, the CAS non-compliances and other CAS cases, if you're dealing in this area, we all know there's a big backlog. And oftentimes these things do come up six years after uh, you think they first accrue. So the board's trying to move away from per se rules about when these types of uh, claims accrue and focus on the individual facts. So that's what, when you're faced with these situations, really dive into the facts and determine whether you have a legitimate claim or a legitimate basis to say that a government claim is barred. All right, thank you.
So, uh, and we're going to have to start speeding things along <laughs> to make sure we get things done. But uh, Michelle is going to uh, talk about um, a contractor behaving badly in this next gig. Yes, yes. Um, so in this case, I'm, this, I'm not talking about some certain anymore. This is actually related to the Service Contract Act um, and the contractor's ability to recover. Um, so I'll, I'll keep it brief with the facts, but it's, it's very interesting. So if you get a chance to read the decision, I recommend that you do. Uh, but here we have uh, the contractor is bidding on a task order. The RFP stated that offerors were responsible for determining the applicable labor categories. Um, and offerors had to identify any non-exempt labor categories covered by the Service Contract Act. So Dynamic knew that the particular labor category at issue in this, uh, in this appeal uh, was covered by the Service Contract Act. Uh, they, were, they asked a bunch of questions to the government. Uh, government said, you know, Service Contract Act applies generally. You decide um, there was an under, some, at some point an understanding that maybe this labor category wasn't covered, although Dynamic knew that it was covered based on its prior experience. Uh, after award, uh, Dynamic won after award, they sought conformance from the Department of Labor because the labor category wasn't in the attached wage determinations. And then Dynamic later sought an equitable adjustment saying, our, our labor rates increased with this labor category. It's now covered by the Service Contract Act. We want to recover. On appeal, the board considered whether Dynamic was entitled to recover uh, for these increased labor costs, whether under FAR 52-222-43 or FAR 22.1015. And the board said Dynamic could not recover under either. Um, and there was also some theories that Dynamic raised related to equitable estoppel, misrepresentation, or detrimental reliance. Uh, and the board said the contractor couldn't recover under FAR 22.1015 because there was no erroneous determination that the Service Contract Act did not apply. Under that, under that um, FAR requirement, it says if the contracting officer makes an erroneous determination or in incorrectly attaches the wrong wage determination, that the contracting officer shall provide an equitable adjustment to any cost impact. So you can get anything, GNA, overhead, et cetera, plus your, your increased um, rate, labor rates. But, um, so the, the, the board said, you can't get that because, um, because there was no erroneous determination. You had to decide, Dynamic, if the Service Contract Act applied to the labor categories that you chose. On FAR 52.222-43, the board said that um, because uh, the SCA actually applied and uh, Dynamic was required to determine which labor categories to use, um, this clause wouldn't allow them for recovery, and it wouldn't allow recovery anyway because FAR 52.222-43 has very specific times in which you can seek recovery for increases of the government decreases uh, to labor category um, increases or wages and wages and fringe benefits, and none of that applied to the base period of performance, and that's what Dynamic was seeking an increase due to the base period uh, because of the conformance that they had. And then regarding the other theories, uh, Dynamic really had some issues proving them. The Army, one, the, the board said the Army didn't mislead you or misrepresent. They said the Service Contract Act applied. Um, most importantly, Dynamic knew the Service Contract Act applied to this particular labor category. Uh, and and the, the RFP and then later resulting contract actually shifted the risk to Dynamic because you got to, Dynamic got to decide which labor categories applied and had to say whether the labor categories were uh, covered by the Service Contract Act. So I think, Paul, this is a really good example of just like, don't game the system. <laughs> um, because in their proposal, they had said, hey, government, we don't think this applies. And by the way, we'll seek a request for equitable adjustment if it does. But they already knew that it did. And the board, I think, here rightly found that they weren't entitled to recover. All right. Good, good lesson. Uh, so now we have the, the privilege of the treat I was telling you about earlier. David's going to walk us through uh, trends in defective pricing litigation. Thank you, Paul. I know what you're thinking. What the hell is defective pricing doing on this panel? First, it is a claim, even if it's an unwelcome government claim. Two, DOJ told me I could repeat this publicly, so I am. DOJ fraud is going to put a bullseye on defective pricing going forward. So this could have been on the claims cost or FCA panel. Three, there's a lot of defective pricing litigation that's running under the radar. You're not seeing it in published decisions, but it's happening as we speak. I'm going to focus on 16 unpublished ASBCA litigations, half of those that have been resolved within the last 
uh, two years. But uh, before we get to that, yeah. I'm going to go through in those, explore what we uncovered in discovery and the five big reasons why these cases didn't make it to trial. Before we turn to those five big reasons, let's uh, take a look at proof of defective pricing. Everybody in this room knows that defective pricing is a government claim and the government bears the burden of proving it. They have to, two things to remember. One, they have to prove all five points of defective pricing as reflected in the contract audit manual. If they fail on even one of those, the government claim fails itself. Second, the third point of defective pricing has two prongs. The data was not disclosed nor known to the government. As we'll see in the upcoming discussion, that has been an Achilles heel in most of the recent defective pricing litigations. So let's turn to the five big reasons. Number one, losing the records. In the last 10 unpublished uh, ASPCA litigations, we found that the government lost or destroyed a bunch of negotiation and audit records. In just the last two years, eight of these appeals had the following examples. The DCAA branch manager admitted DCAA deleted its emails due to storage limitations. That included the pre-award audit uh, emails, which were from the negotiations. Second, one of the DCAA field offices admitted in the ordinary course of business, it destroyed the assist audit and work papers relating to a multi-million dollar subcontract claim. Three, the agency lost the price analyst working papers, same with the DCMA technical analyst work papers. Four, the agency program office admitted that it lost the ECP upgrade files that related to yet another of the subcontractor claims before us. And that's not all. In two other ASBCA litigations, the contracting officer, James, admitted his emails had been deleted due to storage limitations. Also, when asked uh, whether some of the data was handed across the negotiation table to him, the price analyst said, oh no, we got those by emails. POs, quotes, price histories. Were those preserved? Oh no, those were deleted. Without discovery, we would have never known this. With discovery, 10 of these appeals, $140 million of alleged defective pricing never made it to trial. Reason two, vetting the witnesses. Three problems here. One, routinely, DCAA is going to the wrong contracting officer to get their information. In the last eight appeals, the original contracting officer had negotiated this equipment for over 10 years. Who does DCAA go to to ask, did you rely? Was this data disclosed? They went to the follow-on contracting officer. One of those contracting officers was candid enough to say, I can't say yes, I can't say no. I wasn't involved in the negotiations. As the board held in the Rosemount case, that's a loser. Second problem, lack of due diligence. DCAA is not going to the negotiation team, which is real easy to find. You look at the front page of the price negotiation memorandum. So in the last eight appeals, did DCAA ask the agency negotiator? the price analyst, the DCMA technical analyst, the DCAA pre-award auditor. No. Did they look at their work papers? No. Without this due diligence, who knows whether the government knew or did not know about the cost or pricing data. The last is lack of experience. Increasingly, I'm seeing lower and lower levels of experience with defective pricing. When the witnesses have been asked they have routinely said they had no experience. This was their very first run on a defective pricing claim. Now, reason number three, ignoring the negotiation story. Increasingly, the government is not squaring 
its defective pricing theory with the actual negotiations. As we know from the board, the negotiations are at the heart of a defective pricing case. The board recently reaffirmed this in the alloy surfaces case where the negotiation story proved to be decisive in two respects. The agency demanded a 300% ramp up in production, unprecedented in the history of this program. The effect was that Alloy had to go out and hire 250 brand new workers with no hands-on production experience, resulting in huge labor inefficiencies, thus rendering the old historical data essentially useless. Second, the agency had funded the automation uh, had reviewed and approved the equipment and uh, had calculated labor efficiencies down to the fourth decimal place. In effect, the agency knew as much about labor efficiencies as alloy. The real negotiation story in this case defeated the government's uh, defective pricing theory. In another example, in the last eight unpublished appeals, the government had 10 years of negotiation history actually incurred costs, price analyses, technical analyses, pre-award audits. That meant the government had considerable knowledge about this product and had very detailed price analyses, another reason they lost in that case. Reason number four, avoiding inconsistencies. As we know in all litigation, and particularly in defective pricing, contradictions kill as we saw in the uh, Pratt fighter engine competition when uh, the judge said, I just don't believe the witnesses here. They say they relied on the data, but they didn't even look at it. More recent examples of contradictions appear in the price negotiation memos. Uh, in the last 12 PNMs, they have been internally inconsistent. The contracting officer in the PNM says, the contracting officer relied totally, wholly, a thousand percent on the cost or pricing data. But then you turn a few pages further into the PM and it says the price was found to be fair and reasonable based upon price analysis and historical comparisons. Another contradiction, the contracting officer, again in that boilerplate, says relied totally on the cost or pricing data, but when asking the depositions, say, oh, I don't look at the cost or pricing data. That's not even my job. And we've also seen contradictions between DCAA and the agency. You know, we saw that in the Lockheed uh, Martin Aeronautics case. We also uh, saw that in the Alloy case in which the agency didn't follow the DCAA audit recommendations and instead used a little tiny sample of the data to calculate. And they lost credibility in the trial doing it that way. So watch out for the inconsistencies. Reason number five, attacking the delays. Routinely, we're seeing 10, 12, 15 years delays from the time of the handshake to the audit to the final decision. What doesn't work in attacking those delays? Latches, the board said, thumbs down. Summary judgment not particularly effective. 90% of those are denied by the board uh, because they say they're factually too complex and they mostly involve procedural issues. Statute of limitations doesn't work that well either, uh, in part because there's not very much case law on it, and also because DCAA routinely gains this by just d stretching the audit out 8, 10, 12 years. Uh, so they didn't know or should have known about the problem. So how do you defend yourself in these defective pricing cases? One, assert your due process rights to rebut the audit. It's founded and recognized by the FAR and also the contract audit manual. Submit your detailed rebuttal. Attack all the audit and negotiation facts spanning all five points of defective pricing and do it before the agency files its claim so your costs of defense are allowable. Second, if you're paying more than a few pennies on the dollar to resolve the audit, you need to be ready to file your notice of appeal. You gotta get the rule four file and the price negotiation memorandum. You need 
the DCAA pre-award and post-award audit work papers, and sometimes there you find the smoking guns on things like statute of limitations and disclosure. And finally, if that doesn't work, you've got to start discovery. That's where you find out about the destroyed documents. You also establish the gaps in the government knowledge. And finally, that's how you build your defenses on reliance and causation. So with that, get ready for DOJ and their bullseye on defective pricing. Thank all right, you, Paul. Thanks. Yeah, we definitely, definitely a, a good addition to this panel. Thank you. Um, with, with your permission, I'm going to, uh, Chris, skip the FOIA case because we have 10 minutes left and I don't want to don't go over for, for any of you folks, but uh, it, there's, there's more slides on it. So let me talk briefly about, uh, we're, we're now in the uh, fraud uh, section, so, so we had a, a pretty significant um, uh, Supreme Court case in the Schutte versus uh, Super Value and Safeway. Uh, and the, the takeaway, well, first of all, unanimous decision, um, and Justice Thomas held that uh, the False Claims Act scienter element refers to the defendant's knowledge and subjective belief, not what an objectively reasonable person might have known or believed. In other words, uh, you can't get away with a clever lawyer's after-the-fact argument if that's not what the defendant actually believed in determining knowing falsity. So this is a situation the uh, relators uh, claim that SuperValue and Safeway were, were defrauding Medicare and Medicaid. They were supposed to be reimbursed for drugs based on the usual and customary charge to the public. And the relators point was, well, they usually and customarily uh, provide great discounts and matching deals. Uh, but when they seek reimbursement, they don't seek the discounted rate, they seek the full rate. And some of the, some of the evidence in the record, Safeway charged just $10 for 94% of its cash sales for a cholesterol drug, but priced for reimbursement those same uh, drugs at, at $108 as their usual and customary price. There are emails in the record for one or the other saying, hey, don't put this discount in writing. There's execs, uh, executives describing the discounting program as a stealthy approach. Um, <laughs> and so the relators bring these claims. Um, there, now, there are two elements to a False Claims Act violation. One, uh, the falsity of the claim. And two, the defendant's knowledge of, of the claim's falsity. The district court ruled that, that both companies uh, had submitted false claims, but they granted summary judgment on Sienter uh, in, in the Seventh Circuit, later uh, misinterpreting uh, a Supreme Court case, agreed with them, saying you can't prove knowing standard if an objectively reasonable interpretation of usual and customary, it could encompass the higher costs. Well, uh, the court did not have any trouble uh, finding that an objective standard is not the right one. Uh, what it held that the FCA's scienter uh, element refers to a defendant's knowledge and subjective beliefs, not when an objectively reasonable person may have known or believed. Um, so even though usual and customary can be ambiguous, uh, that ambiguity isn't sufficient um, if uh, the respondents uh, actually believed they were doing something wrong. So the takeaway is here, you can't rely on some clever after the fact legal arguments. Uh, it's gonna be harder to secure dismissals on Sienter grounds uh, at the motion to dismiss stage. And uh, um, you should limit, ex uh, limit exposure uh, by actively resolving uncertainties with the government, or at least documenting your reasonable interpretation in real time. The uh, next case we're gonna be talking about, uh, and uh, you don't really need to know the facts here, is, uh, is Polanski. Um, and this is a situation where the government sought to intervene in a False Claims Act case after it had declined initially 
uh, solely for the purpose of dismissing the action, uh, something that, of course, FCA defendants love and uh, relators do not. Uh, and the Supreme Court said, yeah, they can do that. They can intervene um, at any point um, to seek dismissal. The more interesting part of this decision is a dissent by, uh, by Justice Thomas saying uh, he believed that the uh, relator provision is unconstitutional um, because uh, in his view, the executive power is, is vested uh, in the president alone representing the interests of the United States in civil litigation and therefore it must be carried out by an officer of the United States appointed and confirmed under Article II. Um, and private relators don't, don't meet that requirement. Interestingly, there's a concurrence by uh, Justice Kavanaugh and Justice Barrett that says they would also consider the constitutionality uh, of the key TAM provisions uh, in, in an appropriate case. So I'm imagining that we're gonna be seeing that uh, coming up soon. Uh, okay, I told you about Kellogg, Brown, and Root. Uh, here, here is uh, their, their entry this year. Um, and this is, this is one where I, I would say this is, this is the government behaving badly. So after receiving and accepting performance uh, and then getting a, a claim from KB, KBR uh, and going through a lot of discovery, the Army Corps of Engineers moves to amend its answer to add an affirmative defense that, uh, that KBR made material misrepresentations in its initial proposal, rendering the entire contract void ab initio. Poof, it never happened. Uh, so this was a firm fixed price uh, contract uh, to construct uh, an Aegis Ashore missile defense system site on an air base in Romania. Uh, it was awarded in 2013, and it was completed on an expedited basis because of presidential need in 2015. Uh, now, the Corps knew about seven of the eight alleged material misrepresentations in KBR proposal by sometime in 2013 or at least 2014. In some of these allegations, so uh, they say, well, KBR said in its proposal the firm uh, uh, we have firm subcontract and vendor quotes for over 97% of the tasks and materials on the project, which the CO determined pretty shortly after award was not accurate. Uh, other things that we see in a lot of these kinds of cases, KBR proposed a key personnel who was ultimately not available, uh, and they had to switch to somebody weeks after award. KBR proposed a subcontractor to perform uh, security systems work, but shortly afterward, uh, the CO learned that they had a different subcontractor. Um, so what happened here, the, the court, uh, the, or the, uh, yeah, the, the board looked at, did, did the agency um, wait too long here? Was this an undue delay in bringing this, this new argument? And, and they found that it wasn't. So they said extreme delay standing alone usually must encompass two things significant delay in raising a defense after a party knows the underlying facts of the defense and significant delay in raising defense during the litigation, for example, after the trial. Well, this was before the trial, it was after discovery, but before the trial and during discovery, uh, the government made noises that it was gonna, it, it was gonna make that uh, defense. So that, it was not undue delay. Uh, it doesn't matter that the, uh, the court, uh, that the CO didn't issue a final decision. Um, uh, that was, that was the, the next argument. You don't have to issue a final decision uh, if you're raising an affirmative defense of material misrepresentation. Uh, and then uh, finally, uh, uh, the core, uh, it, it, the good news for, for KBR here is although uh, uh, the, the, uh, con the complaint was allowed to be amended. Um, the, the board did say this at the end. At this stage, we must treat the Corps of Engineers' pleadings as true in considering its motion to amend. Because of that deference, the Corps of Engineers' pleadings passed muster. 
However, it remains to be seen whether the agency can prove the alleged misrepresentation, and if so, whether that renders the contract void ab initio, meaning no waiver, or voidable, uh, meaning that the government could have waived it by continuing to seek performance. Uh, it looks like we're out of time right there, and so we're not going to get to the final two cases, but uh, 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 can you join me in, in thanking our panel here? Hello, everyone. Hopefully people can hear me. Um, I hope you enjoyed the rebroadcast of the uh, presentation that the claims panel did recently. Uh, I just saw one question in the chat that I just uh, put one answer in for. If anybody else has any questions, I'd be happy to uh, answer. Unfortunately, none of the other panelists could be here today. Um, but otherwise, uh, we can uh, close it out. So uh, feel free to uh, type a question in and I can read through them. Uh, it seems like there are a couple of questions about CLEs and polls. Um, I don't know, Bill, whether or not uh, you and Pupke have an answer to that. Looks like Bill is typing an answer right now from uh, Pupke. Um, Bill indicates that the poll question did not pop up and he gives his apologies for that. So um, I'm not seeing any questions related to any of the um, slides or cases that were discussed. So, um, you know, I want to give maybe a, a once, twice going now kind of thing. Um, so if anybody has any questions, feel free to type them in now. I want to give people a chance. But uh, otherwise, um, you know, I think we can probably drop off here. Well, this is Bill at PubK. Thanks, Chris, for joining us. I appreciate your time and answering the questions that came in during the webinar. And of course, we appreciate you and our panelists for joining us in February for that live session. Uh, I will be uh, I will be able to track attendance uh, without the poll question. We'll be fine on that. So I, my apologies for the tech issue. Uh, but uh, thank you. And we'll close out and give you a few minutes back in your day as we prepare for our next session. Thank you. Thanks, all. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you to our panelists for their presentations and live Q&A. And again, special thanks to our sponsors whose support made this event possible.